Thanks for staying with us on The Real Story. A new year, a new legislature. The Democrats expanding their majority in both the House and the Senate. And last week, leadership was chosen. My next guest is ascending to the powerful position of House Speaker. Representative Matt Ritter, Speaker-designate, joining us this morning. Thanks for being here. Hi, Jen. How are you? Thanks for having me. Congratulations on your position. I mean, your name was the one, the front runner, for, uh, for this spot. Uh, your reaction to the election and Democrats expanding the majority in both the House and the Senate? It's exciting. Uh, it's, ex it's particularly exciting because we picked up from very different areas, all the way from Fairfield County to Ring Suburbs in Hartford, down to the shoreline in southeastern Connecticut. And so you, you feel good when you're winning seats in different places. Um, it was a brutal election in so many ways, uh, particularly at the national level. I think we're glad it's all over and, and look forward to getting to work. Um, the first call I made the morning after the election was to Vinnie Candelora, who's the Republican leader in the House, and we're going to get to work. I think people in Connecticut should rest assured that we're not Washington, D.C., we're not dysfunctional. We talk, we communicate, and we'll get things done for the state. You know, just because the Democratic majority expanded here uh, doesn't necessarily, we were just talking about this with um, uh, Themis Claritus, doesn't make the governor's job any easier because the Democrats, you guys are a big party. There's a lot of different factions within it, including progressive Democrats, and that's something that you're going to have to figure out how to bring your house together. Tell me about how you're going to do that. Yeah, uh, it's it's always a challenge. We have 98 people, and again, they, they, they hail from all the way close to the New York border to Eastern Connecticut and everywhere in between. Um, I love that diversity of our caucus. I think it's our strength. I think, quite frankly, the reason you're seeing uh, Democrats do well is we sort of reflect, I believe, 21st century of, of the diversity of, of thought and um, gender and, uh, you know, uh, having uh, a diverse caucus in so many different ways, I think, is very, very important. Um, Look, we always manage it. We always get through it. I can't tell you what we're going to pass next year. I know everyone wants to know that. I have 15 people who showed up to the Capitol uh, just a couple of days ago for the first time, and they just got elected. So we'll take our time. We need to see who's the president. It looks like it'll be Joe Biden. What happens at the federal level impacts what we do at the state level. So my job right now is to you know, get us together, get us unified, figure out how we're going to run the session next year, and we'll talk about issues. And, and, and Themis is right. There are some things that Democrats will agree on and others they will not. And it's a matter of working through with the caucus to get there with the Senate and the governor's office. But I would rather have more members with different viewpoints that represent very different towns and regions in Connecticut than have sort of a smaller caucus that I think did not speak or represent all the viewpoints of the state of Connecticut. And it sounds like you have a super majority at this point. Is that correct? We do not. We're at 98. So 101 is a supermajority. We're, we're short of that. Correct. So at this point, if the governor vetoed legislation, what happens? It doesn't get to go anywhere in the House? We could only override his veto with Republican support. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so let's talk about what you hope to put forward. You know, this last session was difficult because there really wasn't a session. You had a few special sessions, um, but and that's because of COVID and the pandemic. But, you know, issues like marijuana and sports betting, those were all topics that were going to come up. I would assume those are going to be on the dock this coming session as well. Of course. And, and you mentioned how we're going to operate sessions. So that gets done in our joint rules, which we negotiate on a bipartisan basis. And so that's one of the first orders of business is we figured out a way, I think, as you mentioned, Jen, we had special sessions. We figured out a way to vote in special sessions safely. We, we had technology, you know, installed that let members vote from their offices for the first time. Committees is going to be a challenge. How do you run committees? You know, the days of having 500 people sign up to testify on a bill. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen come January, quite frankly. So we'll have to talk about that because participation is important. We want to hear what the public has to say. How do we do that safely and with the right technology? Um, so we'll be working on that. Look, big issues. Look, let, let's start with the obvious. Everything that we do as, as a legislature flows from elections. And elections, as we saw this November, require options to vote. So to me, amending our state constitution uh, to make it easier for folks to vote uh, early voting, uh, changing the way absentee ballots is done is really, really critical. Uh, this pandemic, uh, to me, highlighted the reality of how restrictive Connecticut is. We are one of the most restrictive states in the country for voting. And that is, uh, it's just backwards and it's not right. So we'll, we'll fix that. Uh, look, marijuana, I have no idea. I have no idea where the votes are. What I would say is that 
It's happened in New Jersey. It's now legalized in mass. It's legalized. I think New York is closing in. At the end of the day, the reality is it is legal in Connecticut. We decriminalized it uh, for possession under a certain amount. Folks have something called a car, and they drive in a car to buy it in Massachusetts and bring it back. <laughs> so at some point, I think reality has to set in, and I'd rather legalize it, receive revenue, get rid of sort of the black market, if you will, um, you know, expunge records for folks that, that were arrested for it, especially the unequal, unequal treatment that occurred for so long and in, in how folks were sentenced for that based upon, quite frankly, in many cases, racial and socioeconomic status. So those are big priorities. Um, that's two, but also our response to COVID, the state budget, those will be also two very, very major issues, and those are all encompassing, quite frankly. What about transportation? Our transportation problems obviously haven't gone anywhere. Uh, I was listening to something that had said, you know, if, if we do see a President Biden, that money would possibly flow from a transportation bill yep. into the state, but obviously we can't rely on that. So are you just waiting to see, or, or what's the plan? You know, I was an advocate for tolls, as you know, and so was the outgoing speaker, Joy Rasimowitz. A couple of things. I mean, one, we need a revenue stream to stabilize our transportation fund. That is true. I do not believe it'll be tolls. I don't think that'll be an issue this year. But we need a revenue stream, and we need to continue to invest in infrastructure upgrades and projects. COVID has sort of changed potentially the calculus on this, though, which is interesting because the, the model we, we predicated a lot of this on was Everyone wants to get to New York City and come back. Hmm. And now folks are working from home. So I'm not sure really where that will go. Um, I'm not saying that we, we do nothing, but I also don't think that the world will ever be the same. I do expect people to work from home more often, maybe a couple of days a week. So I, don't, I have to wonder what traffic patterns will look like two years from now if that becomes a new reality. Um, yes, the federal government could do a federal infrastructure bill, but I, again, we can't rely on that, as you said, Jen, but I just think for now we will find a revenue stream that stabilizes the fund. I just don't expect tolls to be a big debate this year. Again, and I'm an advocate for it, but you know, my job now and has been as a leader in the caucus is to know where the temperature is. We had that debate. We hashed it out, and the votes weren't there. Um, so I, I guess until uh, if and when um, Republicans and Democrats can come together and put a bill together, that's probably the best option at this point. Yeah, you know, you have this influx of people moving in from the city. I mean, it's a unique you do. opportunity. I, I don't want to say it in a great way, obviously, because it's bad circumstances that it's happening in. Yes. But it is an opportunity for Connecticut. The key is keeping the people who are moving here here for the long term, right? And I would assume that is something you all are discussing. What are your ideas for making that happen? Well, folks moved here for reasons that I think are... Are, are beyond just public health. I mean, obviously, it was the immediate need of COVID, but why you would stay? It's good towns, it's good schools, it's providing health care, it's finding jobs that are, um, you know, that are readily available. All those things come into play. Connecticut is a, very, is a wonderful state. It's a beautiful state. I know that in election time, we, we sort of, you know, they, it's all about, I hate Connecticut, it's a terrible place to live. It's not a terrible place to live. We have our issues, don't get me wrong. Um, we have not completely figured everything out, but a lot of states have challenges as well. But at the end of the day, we have so much to offer. You can, you can go to a UConn basketball game. You can go to a, a, a national state park. You can go to Litchfield County in, in the fall. We have small towns, rural towns, farms, uh, medium-sized towns. We have a lot to offer in terms of quality of life, I think. And maybe it's not for 21-year-olds who wants to live a different life after college. But for people who are raising a family, I think Connecticut's a wonderful state uh, for a lot of places. But then again, there's a lot of improvement that has to come. But I think we're very attractive compared to Boston and New York. On, on the business side, it's more affordable. And if you can work from home, it is a game changer. If you, if you had to work five days a week in Boston, you needed to be near Boston. If you have to work two days a week, you can live in Brooklyn, Connecticut and be 50, 50 minutes away from Boston and drive over a couple days a week. That is a game changer. We used to think that it would be fast trains that would make the difference, not saying it won't, but the game changer may just be technology at the end of the day that lets more people work in these cities partially and spend more time in Connecticut closer to their families. With more Democrats in the House, what's the appetite? What will the appetite be for taxes? A lot of people wondering as they look to, uh, especially this budget session that's coming up. I'm 
to me, that question, not your question, but the <laughs> idea, it's, it's, you know, it's November, right? The, the UConn women have a game in a few weeks against Mississippi State, and I'm sure Coach Ariema would tell you, win or lose, it's not going to affect April and their chances of making the Final Four. And that, that's kind of where I feel like we are. We, we are getting revenue estimates very, very early right now. The major revenue we find out in April. We have no idea what the federal government's going to do. We're trying to figure out where we are with COVID. I don't know what's going to happen. So I have no preconceived notion or end game that we're going to uh, raise revenue or what we're going to do. Here's what I know that we're going to do. We're going to be responsible. We're going to make appropriations that support working families in the state of Connecticut. We're not going to cut our municip municipalities. We're not going to cut ECS funding. We're going to invest in the things that make, as we just talked about, Jen, Connecticut a great place to live. After we've invested in the things that we care about to protect the assets that make us a nice state to be in, we'll see where we are. If there are major revenue issues, then you have that conversation.